uh, change in service plans last week with the electric off. We held the service over at my house, and she wasn't able to do that there, but I'm glad she held on to it and did a fine job. Thank you, Patricia. Take your Bibles to Proverbs 25. Proverbs 25. Stand with me as we're going to honor God and read a verse out of the Scripture. Only one verse for our text today, but you'll see why in a moment. We're going to look at a lot of Scripture, but just one to kind of be a launching pad, if you will. I want to speak to you on good news coming. Good news coming. Proverbs chapter 25. We'll read just verse one, uh, verse 25, just one verse. Proverbs 25, verse 25. Notice what the great proverb says. As cold waters to a thirsty soul, so is good news from a far country. Let's pray. God, we're living in a dark time. We're living in a time when there is so much bad news, negative things around us. Lord, we need some good news. And we're thankful that good news comes only from you ultimately because you have the power to bring to pass what you declare. And so, Lord, as we look deeper into your word today, I pray we'll all be encouraged. And Lord, help us to realize that even though there's so much uncertainty and unpredictability around us and so much that seems topsy-turvy and turned upside down, Lord, you're still in control. We trust your providence and your power and your protection over your people. So bless the service today. Bless your word. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Be seated. We know everyone likes good news. I like good news. You like good news. But these days, good news is really hard to come by. Nearly everything that's coming out of the mainstream media today seems to be negative, seems to be evil, seems to be depressing for Christians. How we'd all just love to hear something peaceful, something wholesome, something that... Oh, I'm sorry, we didn't let the children's church go. I apologize. Let's let the children's church dismiss. See, me leading the singing just doesn't work on a regular basis. Too much to do in one one day. Young kiddos, head with Miss Hunter. Tell that to Angel and Cody next time, how bad things went when they weren't here. Maybe they'll try to make plans to be here whatever it takes. Forgot all about the children's church. We're trying to let them stay through the, through the special. We used to not do that, trying to give them a little less time back there. Anyway, back to the message. Sorry for the interruption. But I was saying how, how we'd all love to hear just some good news occasionally. How about some news that would just, and I'm talking about from the mainstream, so I know I'm wishful thinking here. It's probably never going to happen. But let me just wish a little bit. Wouldn't it be nice if we'd hear some news that would recognize that God exists and that God is good? Wouldn't that be great to hear? Something wholesome, something good and traditional, uh, with traditional values. We just don't seem to hear any good news these days. But there's good news coming. Now, let me give you a couple things about good news, though, is, is kind of a lead into the message today. Several things about good news we have to understand. First of all, good news is only good in the, in the eyes of the beholder, as they say. It's only good if you consider it good. For instance, you know the word gospel, as we use it all the time, the Bible uses it, means good news. But you know, it's not good news to people who reject it. If you ask an unsaved person if the gospel is good news, they, they would say, no, they don't know what it is, let alone that it's good news. Uh, and also, who determines something that's good or bad? Hey, you have to have someone who, who states the standard. Only God can tell us what's really good, so only God can really give us good news. The world's got a lot of bad news, and it doesn't even know what good news is. Now, secondly, I could say uh, the old mission theme. Brother Frank is with us today. I'm sure he's heard this many times, but missionary conferences I've heard use this statement. Good news is only good if it gets there in time. <laughs> right? Uh, I used to hear that years ago when I went to my first conferences and missions, and I used to think that was a tremendous thought, and, and such a convicting thought. Good news isn't good if it doesn't get there in time, right? If we don't get to the mission fields of the world, uh, soon enough, people die without ever hearing of Christ. It wasn't good news to them once it got there, right? And then thirdly, and this is kind of really the most important thing, because we're going to make some contrast today, good news is only good when compared to the bad news. You would know what good news is if you didn't know what bad news was, right? Now, the Bible is full of good news, but there's one very important disclaimer that we have to state up front before we can really appreciate good news. 
we've got to take the bad news first. Do you know the Bible is laid out in that order? Bad news, then good news. Uh, when I started witnessing years ago, when I was called into ministry, I used to get all I could from people who were uh, really versed in witnessing, did a lot of evangelism, and, and I heard them say often, you've got to get people to hear the bad news before you can give them the good news. And that's exactly true. Our Bible is three quarters nearly of Old Testament and one quarter of New Testament. And really, when you read the Old Testament, there's some good things in there, but it's pretty much bad news. It's the law, it's judgment, it's wrath, and then you get to the coming of Christ, the good news. And so before we will ever appreciate good news, we have to understand the bad news. Now today we're going to be looking at a, what I think is a tremendous section of Scripture from the prophet Isaiah. And it says to me some of the sweetest, most special news statements ever made to Christians. But it's going to be in the midst of some very bad news, some very hard things to hear. And so I came to the title of the message, Good News Coming. It's coming. We'll get to it. But we've got to weed through some bad news. We've got to go through some bad news. Well, we're going through a bad period of time right now, right? Man, I tell you, this is, I don't think any Christian could, could uh, differ when I say that this has been an unprecedented period of time that we're dealing with in our country and around the world. It's, it's worldwide. It's a pandemic of worldwide proportion. And, and we have heard nothing but bad news. And it seems like this COVID thing is never going away. And, and on top of that, we've got all this rioting and, and looting and upheaval in cities and government. And we wonder about the elections and, and so forth. And so I, I'm, I'm with you when, when I'm just overloaded with bad news lately. But there's good news coming. Turn with me, if you would, Isaiah 33. Isaiah chapter 33. We're going to do almost a verse-by-verse, verse, not quite verse-by-verse, verse, but almost a verse-by-verse verse study of three chapters in Isaiah that are just tremendous. I was reading them recently, and I just was just spellbound. I stayed in them for a while, and I thought, man, I want our people to hear these passages. These are just tremendous. Because, and i gotta, I got to, again, warn you, now we're going to have to start with the bad news. And we're going to have to see some, some very terrible things and some harsh things and some hard things to read. But then you're going to be opened up to, I think, some of the most precious and beautiful and just joyous passages that we can ever read. And, and it's because it's in the setting, and I'll give you a little bit of uh, lead-in before we jump right into the text. Because this passage, Isaiah 33 through 35, that we're going to look at, is really prophetic. What I mean prophetic, Isaiah is foretelling the future. Now, in Old Testament prophecy, uh, a lot, you'll see, the prophet will give an immediate fulfillment that would affect Israel and, or Judah and or the Jewish people. But many times, as we'll see here, he's going to go way past just the immediate for the, for the Jews and go to the end times, to future end time prophecy, eschatology, theologians call it, end times prophecy. And that's where you and I are going to come in. Because many of the things Isaiah is going to write about, we're going to see how their ultimate fulfillment, yet still in our future, but we're, we're going that direction. We're very much going the direction that Isaiah is going to write about. And so I want to start by looking at the bad news first. The bad news first. And we're going to start actually in chapter 34. And I'm just going to run through these verses with you and make some comments. It's not going to be as depth, in depth as I, if I was a teaching session. But there's just so many things I want you to see. Look at this bad news. Starting in chapter 34, verse 1. Isaiah writes, Come near ye nations. And this is him writing for God. So he's, God is speaking through Isaiah. And he's writing it down inspired for you and I today. Come near ye nations, this is just, isn't just for Israel, not just the Jews, for all the world, to hear and hearken ye people, let the earth hear, and all that is therein, the world and all things that come forth of it. Hey, is there anybody excluded from that verse? No, it's for all of us. Now, here's, here's where the bad news starts coming. God has finally had enough. And there's so much sin, there's so much ungodliness in the world today, and I often have said this, and I'm sure you have. Why doesn't God bring judgment on so-and-so or such-and-such or whatever the event is? Well, He will. This is what this passage is about. For the indignation of the Lord is upon how many nations? All nations. And His fury upon all their armies. 
He hath utterly destroyed them. He hath delivered them to the slaughter. Now, many things he's going to say have their fulfillment in what we call the tribulation period. This is an eschatological term about that seven-year period where God's final judgment is going to be poured out on the world. It's primarily seen in the book of Revelation. We won't go there for sake of time, but in another setting we could study that. But that's a lot of what he's saying when he talks about something already completed like this is when it will be fulfilled then. He says, they're slain, also shall be cast out, and their stink shall come up out of their carcasses, and the mountains shall be melted with their blood. I mean, this is just a worldwide catastrophe, judgment, wrath poured out on all the world. And all the host of heaven, that's the stars, shall be dissolved. They're going to come out of the sky. They're going to fall. There's going to be so much judgment that everything's going to be turned over. And the heavens shall be rolled together. That's the atmosphere, the clouds, everything up there. Together as a scroll, and all their hosts shall, be, shall fall down as the leaf falleth off from the vine and as the falling fig from the fig tree. I mean, he's just talking about just total upheaval. For my sword, God says. Notice it's my God, not Isaiah. He's speaking for God. God is speaking. For my sword shall be bathed in heaven. Wow. Behold, it shall come down, up, down upon Idumea. Idumea was an uh, enemy of Israel, so it's kind of an immediate thing for their neighbors, Idumea. And upon the people of my curse to judgment, the sword of the Lord, there used to be a magazine called The Sword of the Lord, maybe they got it from this, is filled with blood. Oh, this reminds you in Revelation of the bloodshed in the middle of that book and all those judgments that fall. Go up to verse 8, going on to verse 8. For it is the day of the Lord's vengeance and the year of recompenses for the controversy of Zion. And the streams thereof shall be turned into pitch and the dust thereof into brimstone and the land thereof shall become burning pitch. I mean, in Revelation it says there'll be no rain and, and a third of the earth will be scorched by the sun. This is all the same statements. This is how terrible it's going to get. I told you, you're going to have to adhere and, and some, endure some bad news before I get to the good news. I'll get to it. It's coming. It's coming. But you've got to take this first. It shall not be quenched night nor day. The smoke thereof shall go up forever. From generation to generation it shall lie waste. None shall pass through it forever and ever. He's talking about the residual effects of how it will look when all this wrath falls. No wonder Jesus is going to have to come and create a new heavens and a new earth. The old earth is going to be nearly disintegrated by judgment. But the cormorant, that's a kind of bird, and the bittern, two kinds of birds, shall possess it. This is how bad it is. The birds now have come down and they're possessing the earth. They're eating all the flesh of the dead and now they're, they're having a, a good time. And the, howl, the owl and the raven shall dwell in it and he shall stretch about that he is God, shall stretch out upon it the line of confusion and the stones of emptiness. This is just everything's wiped out. They shall call. Now they, they is the people that are left trying to go through this judgment. A few that are still alive, they're calling out on their big shots, the nobles. Help save us! They're calling the government heads. They're calling their military leaders. They shall call the nobles thereof to the kingdom, but none shall be there. And all her princes shall be nothing. T today, where do people look in the midst of all their troubles? They look to government, don't they? We have a society that's now totally uh, dependent on government. We need the government to, to provide this. We need the government to keep us safe. We need to do what the government says about this and about that. And at the end times, Jesus, that's how people are going to be. They're going to look to the nobles, the princes, their leaders. Come and help us. They won't be there. They're anemic. They're totally futile. They're unable to help. He says, and the thorns shall come up. That's a picture of judgment. Remember thorns. The world will be turned to thorns and thistles because of the wrath of God and sin. Up in her palaces, nettles and brambles in the fortress thereof, and it shall be an habitation of dragons and a court of owls. Dragons was a word that King James uses. That it could have been referring to some kind of dinosaur. We're not sure, but some kind of extinct animal. But possibly and potentially animals that will come back during the end times. We're not sure. It's a strange translation. But uh, it says, And the wild beast of the desert shall also meet with the wild beast of the island. They'll all come together to overtake the earth. There won't be enough men to hold them back. The animals, they'll take over the world. It says, And, and the satire, that's probably a hyena, we think the translation would be, shall cry to his fellow, the screech owl also shall rest there and find herself a place of rest. There shall be, uh, shall the great owl make her nest and, and hatch and gather uh, under her shadow. There shall the vultures also be gathered, everyone with her mate. Now, 
We read about the vultures and the birds. Now, let me go on. That's just, just one passage. Now, if you go back to chapter 33, chapter 33 is really interesting. It contains parts of both bad and good news. 34 and 35, all bad news in 34, almost all good news in 35. 33 is kind of a mixed bag of both. Look at chapter 33, verse 1. Woe to, to thee that spoilest, and thou wast not spoiled. And dealest treacherously, and they dealt not treacherously with thee. When thou shalt cease to spoil, thou shalt be spoiled. And when thou shalt make an end to deal treacherously, they shall deal treacherously with thee. He's talking about the enemies of Israel, really. Those who spoiled Israel took away many things and treated them treacherously. You're going to be treated the same way, he says. Woe to you. O oh Lord, and I'm going to stop right there because we're going to talk about that verse later. Look at verse 3. He kind of just back and forth. Verse 3 says, At the noise of the tumult, the people fled. At the lifting up of thyself, the nations were scattered. I mean, I hope you're getting a little bit of what I'm trying to show you. This is just total chaos. This is what, you think COVID's bad and it's really created chaos in the world, confusion. This is the ultimate. Everything is messed. Everything is just thrown out of kelter here. And your spoil shall be gathered like the gathering of the caterpillar as the running to and fro of locusts shall he run uh, to them or upon them. Verse 7, down to verse 7, he says, Behold, their valiant ones shall cry without. The ambassadors of peace shall weep bitterly. Here's again, leaders and people trying to make some sense out of what's happening, trying to salvage something out of the world when it gets like this. They can't do it. The highways lie waste. The wayfaring man ceaseth. The traveler, a wayfaring man's a traveler. He's just going to and fro and thinks he's just in control of everything as he can go wherever he wants. He ceases to exist. He hath broken the covenant. He hath despised the cities. He regardeth no man. That's how selfish people are. That's how they'll get even worse than they are now. They'll regard no one else. The earth mourneth and languisheth. Now he mentions several places here that usually are beautiful places. Lebanon is ashamed. And whom down, they had the, remember the cedars of Lebanon, beautiful trees. Sharon, the rose of Sharon, the lily of the valley. What is it? It's a wilderness. And Bashan, remember the, the bulls of Bashan, a beautiful grazing. And Carmel, shake off their fruits. There's nothing left there. Once beautiful places are left desolate. Now will I rise, saith the Lord. Now will I be exalted. Now will I lift up myself. This is God saying, you know what? Everybody's wondered why it's taken me so long and my people have wondered, how long, oh Lord, how long until you act, until you intervene, until you, you work and do something in the midst of all this evil that's happening? He said, I, I will now. Now I will arise. I will be exalted. I will lift up myself. He shall conceive chaff. He shall bring forth stubble. Your breath as fire shall devour you. Your words will be your doom. And the people shall be as the burnings of lime. And as thorns cut up shall they be burned in the fire. Fire's judgment. And this could be eternal judgment. Could be literal. Could be eternal both. Hear ye that are far off. What have I done? And ye that are near acknowledge my might. We have a world that denies the true God. More and more people are denying Him. He said you're going you're gonna to know who I am. You're going to have to acknowledge it. Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. He says, the sinners in Zion are afraid. Fearfulness hath a, has surprised the hypocrites. Now let me stop right there, because actually that verse pivots right from there. So, I don't want to belabor this too much more, because we have so much more to read, but this is the bad news. Here's God showing in a prophetic passage. And I read it, when I read it a few weeks ago, and, and, I, and I began to think about this, it sounds much like our world is getting like this. It's getting so confused. It's getting in such turmoil that people are looking at their leaders and they're looking for something to, to give them meaning and purpose. And Christians are thinking, God, how long will you let these people do that? These liberals, these atheists, these ungodly, these abortionists, these, all these people. How long will that happen? How long, oh God, will you put up with that? This is bad news. But then I want you to see secondly in the message, this is important. This is the, the whole hinge of the whole thing. I want you to see the bridge in the middle. There's a bridge in the middle. Here's what this bridge is going to do. It's going to take us from the bad news scenario and show us how we get to the good news. Without this bridge, there is no good news. I'd have nothing good to say to you today without this bridge. And this bridge is, I call it a bridge because when I saw these verses, I said, they're right in the middle of things. Oh, bridge is in the middle. 
It's going to be in the middle of a verse. It's going to be in the middle of two chapters. There's a couple little bridge statements. And they come in two questions. So I'll just pose them as two questions. First of all, who's the good news for? Who's the good news for? Look at this bridge statement back in chapter 13. Remember where I left verse 14 right in the middle basically? He then asks this question. Kind of pivots the whole verse. In verse 14 of chapter 33, I ended with, The sinners in Zion are afraid and fearfulness is surprised the hypocrites. Then he says this. Or asks this question. Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? That sounds like a strange question. What is he saying? Who's going to endure this wrath? Who's going to get through it? Who's going to endure all God's judgment? Here they are. He's going to describe us in verse 15. Who, who are they? They're believers. True, converted, saved people. Only ones are going to make it through. He says, he that walketh righteously and speaketh uprightly, he that despiseth the gain of oppressions, that shaketh his hands from holding of bribes, that means he won't hold on to a bribe, he gets, he gets it out away from him, he won't put up with it, that stoppeth his ears from hearing of blood or violence, he doesn't even want to hear about the evil things that are happening, and shutteth his eyes from seeing evil, he doesn't want to be a part of it. Now, this is a really interesting way of describing Christians, isn't it? He doesn't say the people who are going to make it through are going to be the born again, the converted, the regenerate, the saved. He doesn't call it. You know what he does? He describes how we live. Because in God's eyes, if you're not living it, you don't have it. That's what he's saying. He's saying, you know who is going to make it? The people who really genuinely have my salvation because this is how they live out their lives. Boy, it's hard to live out... This kind of life in the midst of all I've been reading. Walking righteously, speaking uprightly. Wow, that's not easy in our day and age, is it? It's getting harder and harder to walk righteously and speak uprightly. But that's the kind of people God says are going to make it. Through all the hardship, through the fires and the judgment that's falling, it's going to be coming all around us. They're going to make it. So not only who is the good news for, the saved, but secondly in this bridge in the middle... How do we receive the good news? Go to chapter 34. There's three ways in which we as believers are going to be able to receive this good news. You've got to be saved first, but this is how you receive it. Now, just being saved doesn't mean you'll really appreciate good news unless you have these three things. First of all, by seeking. By seeking the Lord. Look at chapter 34, verse 16. Seek ye out of the book of the Lord and read. What a great statement in the midst of all that's happening around this passage. He just stops and says, hey, if you want to make it through all this judgment I'm writing about, you better be seeking the Lord. And where's the best place and the only place we can be sure we're finding the Lord? When Jesus said, seek and you shall find and, and, and ask and it shall be given and knock and it shall be opened to you. He was telling us, Isaiah says, if you want to seek me, you better seek me in the book. Seek ye out of the book of the Lord and read. So the first way in which good news is going to make any difference to you, Christian, church member, you better be seeking the Lord in the book. Number two, by calling out on Him. Not only by seeking Him, but by calling out to Him. Look at, again at chapter 33. I stopped there in verse 2 because here's the verse. He says, O oh Lord. That's kind of like he's speaking for Christians here, all of us. Isaiah just interjects his own heart here. And I like that, oh, oh, the emotion. O oh Lord. Be gracious unto us, for we have waited for thee. Isn't that exactly where we are? Lord, when are you going to come? Lord, when are you going to stop this nonsense, this total chaos? How long, O oh Lord? That's what he says, O oh Lord, be gracious unto thee. We have waited for thee. Then he says, be thou there. Now it's all believers now. He's going to say, Himself, not all of us. Be thou their arm every morning. Our salvation also in the time of trouble. God, we need to see your arm. The arm is what God works with. It's His strength. We need to see you work, Lord. Hey, if you're going to enjoy this good news, you've got to seek it out of the book. You've got to call out for it. And then thirdly, and this is ultimately what you have to do, you have to believe it. You have to believe that what God says is going to happen. Or you're not going to make it. You're not going to find good news. And I love verse 22. We put it on our sign about a year ago. It's one of my favorite verses in all the Old Testament. Here it is. Listen to verse 22 of chapter 33. 
For the Lord is our judge. I like that. You know, man's not my judge. He's not your judge. The Lord's our judge. Now, there's a lot of people going to try to pass judgment on you in your life and pass judgment on me, and sometimes we get judgmental of other people too. But who ultimately is the judge? The Lord's the judge. The Lord is our judge. I like this and next. The Lord is our lawgiver. Hey, I know man-made laws. Some are good. Some aren't so good. And I'll tell you, as time goes on, I think there's going to be more negative laws than positive laws. We better remember who the ultimate lawgiver is. The Lord is our lawgiver. We're going to be judged by His law, ultimately, not man's. But then He says, the Lord is our King. <laughs> I love it. The Lord is our King. Hey, I respect our president. I respect our governor. And we're supposed to respect those in authority. But friends, ultimately, as, as things get worse and worse, and they're, they're going that direction, I wish I could tell you that things are going to get better, but they're going to get worse before they get better. We better realize who's king. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. This is my Father's world. <laughs> That's what I want to tell people. This is my Father's world. It doesn't belong to the leaders in Washington. It doesn't belong to the leaders in London or Moscow or anywhere else. It, this is my Father's world. He is our king. And I love this last one. This, all that he just said is going to lead to this. He is our judge, our lawgiver, our king. He will save us. He will save us. Hey, you either believe that or you don't. And if you don't believe it, I pity you. You're never going to make it. It's hard times continue to come. I'm not prophesying anything I don't know. I'm not trying to predict anything I can't be sure of. But I'm telling you, if we're in the end times as I think we are, things are going to get worse before they ultimately come to the good news, which is what I'm going to end on in a moment. I'll tell you, friends, we better realize who's in charge. He's the king. He's the lawgiver. He's our judge. He will save us. Because if he doesn't, who else will? If God doesn't save you from the mess that's going on in this world, nobody else can. Now, that's the bridge. I love that. You had all the bad news. Man, it was, it was bad. It was. It was hard to read. There's going to be a terrible judgment coming on this world. But if you're part of the bridge, you've moved past that. You've moved over the bridge. Now you're into the section of the good news. Let's end by the good news finally. We had the bad news first, the bridge in the middle, the good news finally. Chapter 35, one of the most precious chapters in all the Bible. Listen to how it starts. The wilderness and the solitary place. Now he starts it by telling you how things would get from judgment. The bad news brings it that way. Everything looks like wilderness and solitary place. Empty. But then he says, shall be glad for them. For them. For what? For all the good that God's going to bring, all, all of God's people. And the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice even with joy and singing. The glory. Remember those places I read back in verse 9 of chapter 33 and all the negative about them? Now they're turned away to pause. They're turned back to positive. They're beautiful again. He says, the glory of Lebanon shall be given unto it. The excellency of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord and the excellency of our God. Now let me let you in on some a little hint. Because you're going to see it, so you might as well just know what you're getting into here. This is the coming of Christ. You're going to see Him come here. He's going to be in glory. He's the one that brings all this. He's the only one who can restore this world. Imagine, after all the negative things we read earlier, how is that all going to be turned around? The only way it can be turned around is by Christ coming in the flesh. And He will. And so He says in verse 3, I like this. Here, here you and I are just so beaten up by all that's going on in the world. Strengthen ye the weak knees and confirm the feeble knees. Say to them that are of a fearful heart. Aren't we all like that from what's happening? Be strong! Fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. Even God with a recompense. He will come and save you. Isn't that great? Hey, I don't know when this mess with COVID is going to be over. I don't know what's going to happen with China. I don't know what's going to happen with terrorism. I don't know, I don't know what's going to happen with the election. I know this though. My God will come finally. And when He comes, 
He's coming with vengeance. Now you say, should we include that as part of the good news? Yeah, you know why we should include it? Because he's already said if they'll seek him and they'll find him, they could be saved from the wrath to come. So here's what he's saying. And we, we can look at the imprecatory psalms and the psalms, and the psalmist says the same thing. We want all people to be saved. But if the wicked will not, then we could rejoice that one day they're going to be removed. That's what he's saying. Hey, I pray that every unsaved person, we ought to pray for the unsaved leaders in our country, the unsaved leaders around the world. I pray they'll turn to God and stop their wicked ways before it's too late. But now we're past that. We're past, we're at the end now. And God says, He's coming with a vengeance. And He will come and recompense them. And He will come and save you. Now look at verse 5 and 6. Very interesting. Because you're going to read these with me and think, that sounds like the first coming of Christ. Well, it was. It was a picture He previewed what would ultimately happen later. But listen to what he says. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Remember all the miracles Jesus did with the deaf and the blind? Then shall the lame man leap as a heart, as as a deer, and the tongue and the dumb sing. For in the wilderness shall waters break out and streams in the desert. Well, Jesus brought a little preview of that. But ultimately, Isaiah's not writing about the first coming. He's writing about the second coming and how the world's going to be restored under Messiah. Your God will come. And, verse 7, the parched ground shall become a pool and the thirsty land springs of water. Here, here all that, I told you how everything was wilderness and desert and empty and desolate. Now it's all blossomed. It's beautiful. It's springing forth to life in the habitation of dragons. How bad dragons were. If that is supposed to be dinosaurs, maybe there's dinosaurs that will come back and they'll live in peace in the millennial kingdom to come. That's possible. But he says, no matter what animal that could be translated, it's a bad thing at first, but now it becomes a gentle animal. Where each shall lay shall be grass with reeds and rushes. They'll just lay down and be comfortable and calm. (laughs) I love this one. And a highway shall be there. What kind of highway? We got a lot of highways. This, This is no regular highway. This is a highway to go see God, to go see Jesus Christ. Because he says, and a way, and it shall be called the way of holiness. Now, if I took other scriptures, I could prove to you that during the millennial age, the thousand year reign, there'll be a highway. I don't know what it'll be called. Maybe it'll call be Jesus Highway, the King's Highway. <laughs> there used to be a road called the King's Highway in the, in the old times. Maybe it'll be called that. And you know where that road leads? Right to Jesus in Jerusalem, where he'll be reigning and ruling from a literal temple in Jerusalem. And I think that's what he's talking about. It's the highway. Because, and he says, the unclean shall not pass over it. (laughs) Nobody's going to defile that highway. Talk about littering. There won't be any littering. There won't be any unclean at all on that highway. But it shall be for those. And he says, for those, meaning the saved, for those that are not unclean. And then he just adds this in. It's kind of a hard way to figure out the translation here but he's saying the wayfaring men though fools shall not err therein the wayfaring men according to chapter 33 we already looked at that phrase speaks of the the traveler the vagrant the happy-go-lucky prideful person he's not going to be there he's a fool though a fool he's still not going to be there it means just because he's full that's no excuse he's not going to be there and then he says no lion shall be there wow that's why i think the dragons will be laying down in peace He says, nor any ravenous beast shall go up thereon. Now, this doesn't mean anything when you read this unless you read what I already read to you earlier. Remember I told you good news is not good news until you understand the bad news. Remember all the animals and all the havoc they're they're wreaking over the earth earlier? Now he says there's no problem. There's no lions. There's no ravenous beast. It shall not be found there. But the redeemed shall walk there. The same. Oh, and the ransomed of the Lord shall return. Return of the Lord. It's a, it's a worldwide revival of turning to Christ. Jews, Gentiles that are saved, all coming to the Lord. And come to Zion. That's out on that King's Highway with songs. And everlasting joy upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness. And sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Go back to chapter 33. I've got to give you the last few highlights of these good news. That's not all. There's a bunch more in here. Look at verse 5 of chapter 33. I told you it's intermingled in here. The Lord is exalted, for He dwelleth on high. He hath filled Zion with judgment and righteousness and wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of thy times. Man, we don't have any of that today. That whole time period is going to be called that. Wisdom, righteousness, judgment, because the Lord's going to reign. 
and strength of salvation. The fear of the Lord is his treasure. Those who have it are treasured with it. Look at verse 16 of that chapter. 33, 16. He shall dwell on high. His place of defense shall be the munitions of rocks. Bread shall be given him. These are all just descriptions of good things. This is good news. This is where it all comes. His water shall be sure. Thine eyes shall see the king. We're going to see the king in his beauty. They shall behold the land that is very far off. Oh, we thought, we thought the new kingdom, the millennial kingdom, the coming of Christ was so far off it was never going to come. They're going to see it. It's here. Thine heart shall meditate terror. And that, what it means, this is kind of tough to follow, but he's saying you'll think about things that used to cause terror, but they'll be gone. You'll say, what happened? I don't fear anymore. Where is the scribe? Where is the receiver? Where is he that counted the towers? That's all the leaders. That's all the people who thought they had their whole act together. Hey, where are they? Where are all the big shots? Thou shalt not see a fierce people. You're not going to see any more enemies anymore, any bad people, terrorists, the like none, a people of a deeper speech than thou canst perceive of a stammering tongue that thou canst not understand. Where are all those people at? Look upon Zion, the city of our peace. Solemnities is a word of peace. It means look at all the peace that Zion will have. Thine eyes shall see Jerusalem, a quiet habitation, a tabernacle that shall not be taken down. Wow, imagine how many times the temples in Jerusalem and that whole city was leveled by enemies. Never will it be leveled again. When Jesus rules from Jerusalem, it'll never be destroyed. Not one of the stakes thereof shall ever be removed, neither shall any of the cords thereof be broken. Notice verse 21. But there the glorious Lord will be. Unto us a place of broad rivers and streams, wherein shall be no galley with oars, neither shall gallant ship pass thereby. That was referring to enemies. When ships would come into Jerusalem or into, into Israel on the, on the coast of the Mediterranean, it meant danger. It meant doom. Your enemies were coming to take over the land or kick you captive. He said, no ship shall ever come again. You'll never see a gallant ship again. Now look with me in verse 24. He says, and the, and the inhabitants shall not say, I am sick. Hey, when you live in that kingdom, there'll be no sickness. Death or sorrow, the former things are passed away. And the people that dwell therein shall be forgiven their iniquity. And then two more verses and I'll be done. Look at chapter 34. Here's the good news finalized. In chapter 34, remember verse 16? It started out by telling you how you have to get the good news by seeking out of the book, but I didn't end the verse. Then he says, no one of these, who, who are these? These that seek the Lord out of the book. No one of these shall fail. None shall want her mate. Now the word mate there, you'd think he means your spouse, but that's not really what the word means there. The word mate can mean companion or friend. What he's meaning is you'll never be lonely again. You'll never long for a companion. Maybe you were single for much of your life and you wondered, why didn't God... You'll have a companion. You'll never be lonely again. For my mouth... It hath commanded, this is God saying this, and His Spirit it hath gathered them. He hath cast the lot for them, which means it was determined. It was ordained. This is all going to happen because God said it. He put it down in His providence. And His hand hath divided it unto them by line. They shall possess it forever. From generation to generation shall they dwell therein. Well, folks, I pretty much covered all three of those chapters to show you there is good news coming. But we're going to have to wait for it. It hadn't come yet. I know that. And that's hard to end with. But i got to tell you, it hasn't come yet. But, but I want you to hold on. We've got to hold on. It's like how many people give up on things before the good thing comes? They give up too easily. They drop out of the race too quickly. I want to end by going to the precious words of Christ that I just thought were so beautiful to end the message with. In the Sermon on the Mount, probably... Some of the most precious, familiar words Jesus ever spoke on earth. He laid it out in the same order. It was so precious how he did this. He's going to say things that start with the bad news, but end with the good news. And listen how he says it. Blessed are they that mourn. Are you mourning? Are you weeping? Are you upset? We all are. But then he says, but they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. 
Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. We've got to wait. The good news is coming. Let's pray. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. All of us are struggling to get through this time we're living in. Unprecedented, unique, unusual, nothing compares to it. And it's easy if we're not careful that we could just think things are crumbling around us. And I'm afraid that this whole COVID and the climate of our world is going to really weed out the weak and the really unconverted, the false convert, the person who really wasn't saved. I know it's going to do that, but I also fear that it may discourage and, and get some Christians to where they want to give up. We don't want that to happen at our church. We don't want that to happen with people we know that are followers of Christ. We need to realize good news is on the way. It's coming. But it's going to get worse before it gets better. So hunker down. Trust God. Seek Him out of the book. Believe Him. Realize it. We've got to call upon Him every day. Our prayer lives ought to be so much more focused, so much more fervent than they ever have been. I don't know about you, but I think I've prayed more fervently in the last four or five months than I probably have in the last four or five years at least, or maybe my whole Christian life. I don't know. Because, man, I don't have all the answers, and you don't either, but I know who does. God does. And so the invitation today is going to be just an encouragement to you, friend. Realize, yeah, we're living in bad times, hard times, bad news all around us. But as Isaiah so beautifully penned under the inspiration of the Spirit, good news is coming. Believe it, wait for it, and seek it. After I pray, if you want to get along with God where you stand, you can come up here if you want to make a need known or want to pray by yourself here, you can do that. But I want you to just take a minute to say, God, help me to hold on, to, to have the right perspective, not to get so weighed down and so discouraged and so depressed about what's going on around me, but to realize you are in control still. Our Father, our God, we commit this service now and this subject into your hands because only you can be our encouragement. I remember where David said he strengthened himself in the Lord, and that's what we've got to do today. And Lord, we need to strengthen each other as much as we can, be an encouragement to each other, to hold on, to rally around each other. May we be uh, the, the upholding of each other in encouragement as we are living in dark times. Thank you, Lord, that your word has already declared what's going to happen. We don't have to think about it, hope for it in a sense. We don't have to predict it. We know your word already says it, that you're going to come and good news will flood our lives and history will never be the same once you come. But until then, help us to occupy till you come. Speak to every heart now in this invitation. We pray in Jesus' name.